Welcome to the History of the Papacy podcast, a podcast about the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Prepare yourself to step behind the ropes and leave the official tour of the story of the popes and Christianity. I am your host, Steve Guerra, and I thank you for joining me on this journey. You can find show notes, how to contact me, sign up for our mailing list, and how to support the history of the papacy by going to our website, a2zhistorypage.com. Two great ways to support the history of the papacy are leaving your ratings and reviews on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. And another really great way to support the history of the papacy is by going and joining us on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash history of the papacy. Your support on Patreon goes a long, long way to help keep the history of the papacy sustainable for a long time in the future. There are four tiers of support on Patreon. Antioch, Alexandria, Constantinople, and Rome. Each of these tiers represents one of the traditional patriarchates of early Christianity. There are many great benefits to you for supporting the show on Patreon. You will receive early and advertisement-free content, bonus episodes, monthly book drawings, and most importantly, you will be included on the history of the papacy diptychs. In traditional Christianity, the diptychs are the lists of bishops commemorated in order of their precedence. The sooner you sign up on Patreon, the higher you'll be on the lists of the history of the papacy patrons. Now let us commemorate the Patreon patrons on the History of the Papacy Diptychs. We have Roberto, Joran, William B., Brian, Jeffrey, Christina, John, Sarah, William H., Augustus, Keanu, and Judy at the Alexandria level, Dapo, Paul, Justin, Lana, John, and Steve, all of whom are magnificent at the Constantinople level, and reaching that ultimate power and prestige, that of the Sea of Rome, we have Peter the Great, Leonard the Great, Alex the Great, and Amma the Great. With that, I hope you enjoy this next piece of the mosaic of the history of the popes of Rome and Christian Church. Well, as you know, today we have Marco Capelli of the Storia di Italia podcast on. Again, uh, you, if you haven't listened to our collaboration that would have been a few months ago. You should definitely go back and listen to that now. It was awesome. Now, I'll, I'll let Marco tell more about himself, but as you sh- uh, should definitely know, he has a podcast where he tells the history of Italy in Italian. So if you don't know Italian, you should definitely learn that too while you're at it. <laughs> well, thank you again, Marco, so much for coming on the show to talk about this really huge topic of the Risorgimento and the Italian unification. And I really appreciate being able to have such a great source to talk about this fantastic topic. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, Steve, I was listening to you before I even started podcasting. So uh, it's uh, always an honor. Uh, it's, a, it's a double honor to be here for the second time. Thank you. And now uh, we are, well, why don't you tell us a little bit about your podcast? Because I get, uh, eventually you'll get to the, the Risorgimento Italian Unification. Uh, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your podcast. Sure, sure. So um, my podcast, of course, uh, um, starts actually very early, uh, a bit where you started as well. So uh, I start with Constantine, uh, and um, the program is to really uh, retell the whole history of Italy. And while I'm at it, since there are not so many podcasts in Italian, I also tell the story of the entire Mediterranean, and probably I will, you know, I will touch base with most uh european countries over time because uh, they all they're they are all intertwined so it's you can't separate the history completely and i'm against it uh, so you know i i like to see how every everything interacts with each other um i started a podcast about two years ago a bit more than two years ago um and uh well it's it's been a ride it's been fantastic uh, i um, I, I've grown with it, and it has given me like a, a new sense of of living. Um, so 
it, it's it's great because there weren't, as I said, there weren't so many history podcasts in Italian, and there are now more. And everyone that starts usually writes me and says, "Ah, oh, thank you so much. I like so much your show, and now I want to make mine." So, so that that really makes me happy. That's awesome. You're like creating a genre. That's you're <laughs> you're a trendsetter. <laughs> yeah, really, because it, it, it's like it's a new new trend of Italian uh, history podcast. So, so I'm glad about that. That's awesome. I guess to maybe let's set it up this way. Let's get started with just this whole word of risorgimento. What does that mean in Italian? Well, it means uh, resurgence, re- rebirth, um, uh, coming anew in a way. So it's different. And it's, it's very telling that it's not reunification because uh, uh, you could say, okay, it's the Italian reunification. Why Italian call it risorgimento? Risorgimento is like, you know, when you have a river that goes under the earth, no? Mm-hmm. And then comes out of the earth again, that's called a risorgiva. So it's coming out again. It's like a, like a river went underground for a very long time, maybe, and then comes out again. So the whole idea of Risorgimento is that Italy was lost for such a long time, that, but it will be reborn again and, uh, uh, and will come out again. So the idea is it's not the birth of Italy. Like in America, you will have uh, you know, the foundation of America. 1776 is the birth of the country. The idea of Risorgimento is not a birth, but a rebirth. Steve here again. We are a member of the Parthenon Podcast Network, featuring great shows like Chris Mowery's Vlogging Through History and many other great podcasts. Go over to Parthenon Podcast to learn more. And now here's a quick word from our sponsors. The Italian unification, it's not something like maybe the American Revolution, where there's 1776, and a couple of years later, it's a country. This is something that takes place, at the very least, over the course of most of the 19th century. Maybe it's set the the broad uh, overview of the time where this is happening. Sure, sure. And it's very important, I think. So (laughs) the first thing to understand is that Italy... Uh, has been divided at this point of time in the 19th century since the 6th century. So we're talking about 15th century. of the, um, And at that time, uh, the, something very important that had, had happened and is the French Revolution. So the French Revolution, 1789, it's like the watermark of European history. There's a before and after. Um, the French Revolution swept aside the ancien, ancien regime, the old regime of Europe, with of its nobles, its great houses, its uh, the, the power of the church was broken. That's another thing. It was completely broken because lots and lots of the land and the properties and the buildings were taken away. The, uh, a lot of the uh, institutions of the church were dissolved. So the monastery, institutions, etc., so that broke like a big piece of the old system. And for there was a new civil code which uh, created a new way of regulating law, which is at, at the basis of all European and I would say all non-Anglo-Saxon legal system in the world is at the basis of the Code Napoleon, the, the Napoleonic Code. So this enormous tsunami washed all Europe, but then it receded. So in uh, uh, between 1812 and 1815, Napoleon uh, was defeated by a coalition and then defeated again. And at that point, we have the Congress of Vienna and the Restoration. So the powers of Europe tried to rebuild the world as it was. They could not quite completely wish the French Revolution away. That was impossible. But they did try their best to bring the clock back to 1780. Um, there were three great reactionary powers. Those are called, they were called, they, they, they said like this, they, they believed they were the reactionary power, reaction to the French Revolution. And these were uh, Prussia, Russia, and Austria. The three powers that kept the system 
in place in Europe after the Congress of Vienna. And uh, the system was based on absolute monarchy. So no country was supposed to have a constitution. That was considered a liberal uh, idea, so con connected to the French Revolution. Uh, so uh, no constitution, the power comes from God, doesn't come from the people, comes from God. And the monarch, yes, of course, he doesn't rule completely alone, but he appoints his minister as he wishes. And, and basically, the power is all with him in theory. Then usually, funny thing, these absolute monarchs usually have prime ministers that are more powerful than them sometimes. Like the biggest, baddest of them was Metternich. So Metternich was the prime minister of Austria for 40 years. And that's, you know, the entire reaction time. So the entire period uh, where we have this uh, system in place. Now, not everything could go back the way it was. You know, the, a lot of monasteries were not rebuilt. The laws remained. Um, a sense of regained role for the people remained. And it was hard to completely go back. So we have these two forces. The great disruption of the French Revolution, which really is the revolution of Europe at the end, and uh, the force of reaction. Now, these forces get mixed in with nationalism. Nationalism, you may think that nations have always been here, but that's not actually true. The U.S. is one of the oldest nations on earth because it was founded in the 18th century, but that's not the case for most nations. Nation statehood really is a romantic idea. And it comes out, romanticism is that this period of time, of, sometimes it's called also the romantic period, the first half of the 19th century. Um, so uh, the sense of nationalism comes out also from the French Revolution, because the French Revolution had stoked a sense of nationality in the French to start with. So the French had become a nation. It was not a land anymore ruled by a king, but a nation of 30 million people. And that remained after the restoration and and other and then other people started to think and, and you know they were really creating the people at the time they were starting to think oh but maybe we are a people too if the french are a people then maybe we are too and this applies extremely well to so italy had not a sense of national uh unity before the french revolution uh but after the french revolution uh which had created new form of government in italy of course, led, uh, dominated by France, but those forms of government were considered important by the uh, local elites. The local elites, for the first time, participated to elections. They had their own men in power, not an appointee from a distant king uh, or an absolute monarch. So they had experienced a new form of government. Uh, not of a national unitarian government at the time of the French Revolution. They were still separate states, but they were very different from the absolute uh, um, uh, kingdoms of before the French Revolution. They were liberal kingdoms, so they were more akin to a British or French system of government. And that has stoked something. As, as long as there was the French Empire, that remained a bit subdued because Italy participated willingly in the building of uh, a French-dominated Europe. Unlike other countries that really resisted, Italy did not resist because it's so... I mean, I, I'm generalizing, of course, there were people that were against and people that were in favor, of course. But overall, the Italian elites participated in the, in the, in the new system, in the new Europe that France and Napoleon had built. But then all that new Europe vanished. And then the Italians looked around and, and started thinking, maybe we can build, too, a country, something we haven't had forever. And, uh, and, and maybe we are a people. So that, that really, and again, we are talking here about the elites, the educated elites. So fairly large. We're talking about uh, sometimes, you know, developed areas of Europe. So there were a lot of people that read and studied, uh, etc. But we're talking about the people that read and studied. The you know the peasants. They probably thought a bit about themselves, you know, as Neapolitans or Venetians or Florentines. They didn't really care about this. Set. 
But this sense of national nationhood developed a lot in between 1815 and 1848. Let's keep in mind these two dates, very important. 1815 is the, uh, is the fall of Napoleon, 1848, we will see, is the spring of nations. So be, in this period of time, we have this growing sense of nationhood and the building of uh, secret societies that you know, start tying together the activists in Italy to create something. Yeah, that's very interesting. So even I can handle two dates, 1815, 1848. Those are the two big dates. Maybe before, the, the, I think probably the next big thing is that Italy really wasn't, or at least the Italian peninsula was at this point made up of almost countless duchies, kingdoms, states, republics, this, this, and this. What was the general, I guess you might say, lay of the land in the Italian, the greater Italian peninsula in this 1815 to 1848 time frame? And, you know, at the end, yeah, there were a lot, but the important ones are not so many. So we can go through them quite easily. The first one is Piedmont Sardinia. So Piedmont, by the way, there is a region I discovered in, in, in the Appalachians, uh, you know, near uh, in, in South Carolina called Piedmont. And it, it, I believe it's for the same reason. It means Piedimonte, so at the feet of the mountains. So here is uh, an area at the feet of the mountains, so, you know, like uh, er, near the mountain. Um, in northwestern Italy, uh, the capital of this uh, kingdom was Turin. Um, the house ruling this kingdom was the house of Savoy. Now you may think, wait a second, I know Savoy. Uh, you know, some people that know France will know that Savoy is in France. It's, you know, the, the, the Alps. Huh? And the reason is that the Savoy family comes from France. So the originally, I mean, from what today is France. So they were rulers of, of the county of Savoy uh, from Chambéry. Chambéry was their first capital across the Alps. But then they built like a, a state straddling the Alps. So they had some dom dominions in, uh, you know, on what today is France. They also had Nice, by the way, Nizza, you know, in Italian is Nizza. And at the time, Nice was an Italian city and Garibaldi, probably a lot of people know Garibaldi at least, Garibaldi uh, was born in Nice, what today, on the, what today is Côte d'Azur in France. So they had Savoy, Nice, the northwestern Italy, and funny enough, Sardinia, the island of Sardinia. Uh, and that's where the title actually of king came. That's why we call it Piedmont Sardinia. Now, Piedmont Sardinia was the strongest military speaking kingdom. And it was also the most developed in terms of uh, um, economical development. They bet early and strong on railways. Uh, they had a good development and they had, and you will see it, it's also the first one to have a, a real liberal uh, uh, government. At the time, between 1815 and 1848, it was forbidden to have a constitution, otherwise the other powers will declare war on you. Uh, but they kept and as free as possible. So freedom of speech of sort. So they were kind of the more liberal kingdom as well. Okay. So that's the first one. Then we have Lombard, um, the kingdom of Lombard, Lombardia and uh, Venice. Now, uh, Lombardo Veneto. You know, this in reality was not a kingdom. It was part of the Austrian Empire. So the Austrian, I say Austrian Empire, notice, not Austro-Hungarian. Because it was not Austro-Hungarian yet. Um, only after 1848 it becomes the Austro-Hungarian Empire. So it was the Austrian Empire built by the Habsburg, the greatest of the greatest uh, houses of Europe, uh, much more important than the Windsor or uh, you know, of England. They were the Habsburg are the the top of the top, and the Habsburg had dominated Europe for centuries. At the time, they were ruling over what today is Austria, Czech Republic, um, Slovakia, Hungary, uh, Croatia, Slovenia, uh, and all the, uh, the north of Italy except Piedmont Sardi and several other uh, dominations. It's complicated. But it was, a, it was a huge empire and it was the dominant power in So all the other kingdoms, all the other states 
had to deal with the fact that the Austrians were the top of the dog. Imagine it a bit like, uh, you know, um, a situation uh, where uh, you, after the, in the Cold War, you had, you know, America and, you know, dominating the bloc, the Western bloc and the Soviet Union dominating the Eastern bloc. You know, if you were a small state in one of these blocks, you had some room of uh, maneuver, but, you know, you had to deal with the fact you had the superpowers. So that's this, the same situation with the other Italian states and Austria. Austria was the dominant power, even though it ruled only one piece of it. Then we have a few small states that's not, met, not, wor- not worth talking about. But the next important one is the Grand Duchy of Tuscany, uh, one in once upon a time uh, ruled by the Medici family, the famous bankers and noblemen, and, uh, you know, creators of popes as well, several Medici popes. I can probably post a map of this, but more or less, we're generally going in a um, kind of a clockwise, no, north to south direction that's kind of clockwise. So we're kind of wrapping our way around. Yeah. So Piedmont Northwest, then Lombard, Veneto, North, North, East. Then we are going to Tuscany here in the center. And Tuscany was ruled by a a monarch, um, a grand duchy, grand duke of Tuscany, of the house of Habsburg Lorena. So it wasn't anymore uh, the Medici. Then the next one, there's only two more to talk about. The next one is, of course, the Papal States. The Papal States stretching on a funny shape, let's say zigzagging through Italy, and it's not a coincidence that's the, sh- the shape, because um, that's the shape of the Byzantine dominions in Italy. So we're talking about the sixth century. And, you know, and, and then those had become the papal states when Charlemagne intervened in Italy. It's a, long, it's a story. You talked about it a bit. So, so just to give a sense to the listeners that this story goes way back, okay? And these papal states were built basically on the main axe in the Roman time. From Rome, you would go with a road to the Adriatic, going north, a bit east. You would cross the Apennines there, and then you will swing to go to the north. So that was the main road. And around that road, the papal states were built. Of course, the main city there is Rome, and the papal states are ruled by the Pope. He has prime minister. He has a prime minister. It's still, it's a government. Still, you know, it used to be ruled more autocratically, but even the, the French Revolution had passed also through the papal states, so they could not rule anymore. Uh, like you know, just a council of bishops, they had to uh, involve some form of, of local elites. Um, and then uh, the last one is the Kingdom of Naples. The Kingdom of Naples, or it's called finally the Two Sicilies. Don't ask me why it's the Two Sicilies. Because there's only one Sicily. You know, people think, why to Sicily? The Sicily is one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to know why? <laughs> it takes three minutes. <laughs> I don't know if you want. Yeah, I've always wondered that too. Yeah, let's, <laughs> we might as well. That's, I mean, I, I think uh, the, I have always wanted to know too why it's called the kingdom of the two Sicilies when there's clearly only one. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason goes back to the Middle Ages. Um, in the 15th century, um, I, sorry, in the 14th century, that was a united kingdom. So everything from Naples, imagine, from Naples, south, including Sicily, was a kingdom built, by, by the way, by the Normans uh, from Normandy, France. They, anyway, it's a long story. So they built this kingdom, and then this kingdom passed to the House of Anjou, a French house, very, very important French house in the, fourth, in, the, um, in the 13th century. In the 14th century, in Sicily, there was a rebellion against the Anjou. It was really a popular rebellion against uh, their overlords. And because at that time you couldn't be without a king, they called in another king to be their king. And this was the king of Aragon. Aragorn. So Aragorn is, is uh, uh, Aragorn. Sorry, Aragorn is another. <laughs> is from the Lord of the Rings. So Aragorn is, is, is a region of Spain, you know, and then Aragorn and Castile merged to become Spain. So the king, of, so, so you had, and both of them claimed to be the king of Sicily. Why that so? Because the Normans, when they had built this kingdom from Naples to Sicily, they were ruling it from Sicily. So it was called the kingdom of Sicily. So they were both saying, we are the king of the Sicily. 
So they, you had the king of Sicily from Sicily. And then you had the king of Sicily that really was in Naples. But he kept c- calling himself king of Sicily. No figure. When they merged the two, again, uh, many centuries later, they called it uh, the kingdom of the two Sicilies because they had re- merged the two Sicilies. Sorry. That's <laughs> that's the reason. Really worthwhile to talk about that because I think you've really painted a picture that this is a really long story and there's so many complications and so much history that gets us to 1815, 1848, that it's not just something that kind of bubbled up. Oh, yeah, that, that'd be cool to be one unified uh, Italy, that there's a long, long story that goes back to the seven, six and seven hundreds AD, not yeah, the 1600s, exactly. like the 600s. The 600s, yeah, yeah. It's 600, not the yeah. one 600. So this is, uh, this is, uh, this is true. And, and here's the thing, you know, uh, for a long time, Italians didn't think about themselves as Italians. They thought about themselves as Florentine, Romans, Neapolitans, Sicilians, and so on. And even the language, although there was a literary language uh, spoken by the very tippy top of the elite, they really could speak Italian, the vast majority of the people uh, did not speak Italian. They spoke what we call dialects, but in, in any other country will just be called languages because they were actually really far apart. And in many cases, they were literary languages. So you had poets and writers in the local language, although thanks to the strength and power of, the, of Dante's Divine Comedy, which was written in this, uh, uh, created in a sort of way language of Italian, because he built it in a way, Dante in order to write for the first time a great great masterpiece in a vulgar language, as he called it. So again, we're going back to the 14th century. So Italy had a language, but that language was spoken only by the elite and and not by the people. So you you need to understand that this is really a nation-building exercise that we're talking about. Steve here again with a quick word from our sponsors. Maybe this is a good point to talk about who were some of the the various groups that were working to try and build this this idea of an Italian identity over uh, being Roman or Neapolitan or too Sicilian. Uh, who were the there? There was several different groups that were all in on this um, nation building project. Yeah, and they and they were very different. So, so first of all. Of course, there were also the react, the, let's say, the conservative, uh, the the people that for for whom you know the system just worked fine. They didn't see why rocking the boat, mostly you know uh, feudal uh, of uh, lords or you know or some high echelon of the church, but not even that many. And some people with just the inclination of keeping the status. So. That, you know, when I talk about the different people, you know, different parties that wanted unification, etc., don't forget that there's also the people that are against. Like in the American Revolution, it's the same. You know, you have also the, the people that were just fine being British citizens, British subjects or citizens, right? Um, so uh, among the people that, you know, strived for, uh, um, for a unification, let's say they, they were, I will say, you know, uh, Churchill famously said, one Italian, a good person, two Italians, a fight, three Italians, three political parties, which, by the way, is true still today. <laughs> so, of course, uh, I will tell you about three groups, but don't ever think that there is only three. These are three, you know, broad groups. <laughs> OK, but let's say three parties. The first one is kind of the heirs of the French Revolution, the heirs of the Jacobin. These are the liberal Democrats. These are the, um, the biggest, baddest name is Mazzini. Mazzini is the, you know, for a conservative of the time, for a reactionary of the time, he would be considered a terrorist. And of course, you know, history is funny. So, you know, it's a terrorist or it's a uh, liberator or a fighter, a freedom fighter, depending on the point of view, right? Um, uh, Mazzini, 
Um, and the people that came before him they were called Carbonari. It's another story, but let's not go in there. But um, they believed, first of all, they were strongly anti-clerical. That's a very important thing because one of the powers they wanted to abolish was the power of the church, which, of course, is very controversial with other groups who will talk. So strongly anti-clerical, strongly republican. Again, republican at this time, you know, imagine it was an anathema to have a constitution. So I have a sort of a liberal, uh, liberal monarchy. Imagine a republic, unthinkable, you know, and you can say, and there were no republics in Europe at the time. The only, uh, the, the few republics that existed in the Ancien Regime were also swept away. So Venice and, and Holland used to be republics, but they were destroyed by the, by, by, by the Restoration uh, and by the French Republic, French Revolution too. Um, so the, the only republic uh, of significance was Switzerland. Um, so there were no republics, and these people, Mazzini, they were republicans. Again, that's why I'm saying, you know, these are really like radicals for, for the people of the time. And so they were republicans, democrats. They wanted democracy. Uh, again, uh, another crazy idea, you know, uh, <laughs> something from, uh, you know, uh, unthinkable at the time. And by the way, even America at the time was not a full democracy. I mean, it would become of during these years there would be universal suffrage, but uh, but at the beginning it wasn't a universal suffrage. So even if you exclude women, which again you can say the universal suffrage we only achieved it in the 20th century. But even if we keep it only at men, uh, uh, that was a process uh, even in America and in Europe, uh, continental Europe at the time was just unthinkable. So these are the um, the, the the group of Mazzini, R- Republican democratic, anti, um, uh, anti-clerical. There were even some proto-socialist mixed in this bag. So you have some starting to have, uh, we are at the time of Marx here. Huh? We're, so we are, we are almost contemporary with Marx. So we have, and, and Marx is not the first socialist. So we have the first socialist already, I will say, mixed in this bag. In general, their goal was to create this democratic free republic. And then they thought that next, many of them thought next we should also deal with how unequal European societies are, a very unequal distribution of wealth. Okay. So this is the first group. The second group were the monarchists. The monarchists really had one monarchy in mind. Well, their, mo- their model was not a, a republic, but it was a liberal of the sort that England had. So with a king, so we don't rough too many feathers from the powers to be of Europe. So the Republic is crazy. Let's have a monarchy, but with a government, with a parliament, with a constitution, with liberal freedom, uh, maybe we'll even make a, a good chunk of the people vote. Not everybody, of course, that's crazy. Uh, you know, but, uh, but we'll make you know, a good percentage of them vote. You know, people that have studied or that have property will make them vote. So those are the liberal monarchists. They really, their real champion was the House of Savoy and the kings of Piedmont Sardinia. They realized that if there was one king uh, around which uh, the, you know, the, the, the Italy could be unified, that, that's what, that, that was it. The third group, uh, which maybe ties in better to the story we want to tell, are the and federalist neo Guelphs. Okay, so they're not the same thing. You know, there were federalists that were not neo Guelphs, but and neo Guelphs that were not federalists. But overall, let's talk about this group. So the group basically saw it as neo Guelph again, and other terms that comes from the Middle Ages. Who are the Guelphs? Uh, probably people listening know this, but Italy in the Middle Ages was divided between Guelphs and Ghibellines. The Guelphs were the pro-pope, and the Ghibellines were the pro-emperor, uh, very simplified. So why New Guelph? Because they were, they were thinking, okay, not, not a king. What is the great power of Italy? It's the pope, the papacy. Papacy has been here for 2,000 years and has always been a leader of the country in certain as of sort. Uh, so maybe what we can do, we can build a new Italy with, as a, instead of having a king, having the papacy being the head of state. And 
Also, another trend in here that I alluded to is that they were federalist in the sense of, in America, it's the opposite, I noticed. So the federalists are typically the people that want to federate, so to make everything a lot stronger, stronger the the political center. Uh, Whereas uh, in Europe, a federalist is is, is against a strong political center, wants a federal government, federal government, you know, again, this is a problem between Europe and America. Federal government, per nature, is less centralized than a centralized form of government, like France has. France has a system of government where, you know, Paris rules, uh, and then you have the departments, but, you know, they don't count that much. It's not like the United States or Germany or Switzerland. These are federations. Uh, and so the, the new wealth and the federal, federalists, they wanted to build an, an Italy, recognizing that Italy was very different. You had, you had pieces that were behind, pieces that were ahead, different cultures. And maybe we, instead of canceling and creating a unitarian, homogeneous state like France has, maybe we should recognize our history of division and create a federation of all the different countries that makes Italy with that federate and create a federal government okay um, so and probably we can start with a uh, economical union again it's something that Europe is doing now no well we can we can try to do like a, a union uh, of you know market union you know common market and then from there we will develop a political union um, and by the way this is the, the road that also Germany uh, followed. Germany followed exactly this road. Then it became a lot more imperial down the road, but they started like that. They started creating an economical union. So we have these three groups. And as you can see, you know, the, the, the Mazzini kind of guys, they want a centralized, strong Jacobin government, Republican. The Federalists, they want a federation of the existing states that doesn't abolish the current structure. And they want the Pope as the head of state, which is absolute anathema for the, these guys here. So you, you see how I do with my hands, you know, like, you know, left and right. In the center, there are the monarchy. They are unionists, so they can appeal to the Republicans if they play their cards right. And they can appeal to the Guelphs because they are not going to destroy the, the power of the church. They are not to. Um, and they are and they are more less radical in the changing of the form of government. You know, it's a monarchy, it's not a republic, a crazy republic, you know. So I'm trying to make you go into the mentality of the time. So of course it's not crazy today, but at the time it, it was considered a, a radical to think to a republic.